My aunt has a clivia, which is between 45 and 50 years old. And it has always been healthy, but now its leaves are drooping. Please help us because we consider it a family friend. Could be plant hardening of the arteries. On the other hand, it's wonderful to be able to grow plants to that age. And let me show you how in this program, which curiously enough is called... flourished under our care, get a sort of emotional hold on us, particularly if they're associated with family occasions. This enormous clivia, which was a clivia, uh, Christmas cactus, which was simply gigantic before I hacked it back earlier because I didn't know it was going to be on television, was given to me as a cutting about this size, just before our twins were born, about the only thing I could still lift. And if, like the grandfather clock that was too tall for the shelf, it were to stop short never to go no more, I should be considerably upset. Just as I was when a huge old crashula that I'd pried out of a dish garden that had been sent to another daughter when she was quite sick, died through overwatering uh, in my absence. And I worried so much about that, I was so emotionally so involved, that I managed to get a small sprig of it to grow on, and it's now this size. I intend to bequeath it to that particular family, though they don't know it yet. And if, which seems extremely unlikely, that the twins quarrel over their Christmas cactus, they're going to have to draw lots, because that's not a dividable plant. Then there's the jasmine. It may not impress you wildly, but I've grown it to that size in less than 10 years from a sprig that looked like that, which came out of a daughter's wedding bouquet. And it's, of course, full of very poignant associations. And it also serves the enormously practical purpose of bloss blossoming, bursting into bloom, just around our wedding anniversary and reminding me to telephone. So, these were tiny little things when I started. And this is not sentimentality on my part. This is part of the mesh and fabric of family life. It's a remembrance of things past. And I should be very sorry not to be associated with plants in that particular way. And it doesn't take all that time even to build up an association. This is the first plant I ever dealt with on television. It's uh, an accent plant that, talking rather nervously to a group of people, an audience I wasn't at all sure existed, I showed them how, if you put the things together, ouch, very well crocked, uh, it would and things grow into large and flourishing in a very short time. And so it has, because that was less than two years ago. And if it were to die, I think I might start taking my own pulse. Because as you can imagine, there's a very strong symbolic connection between it and me. And I'm not alone in my feelings this way. I know an old lady in a nursing home whose only personal possession is a plant she grew originally from a cutting. And I have another aged friend who's rejected three suitable apartments found for her by the, her harassed relatives because none of them had a place for her rubber tree. So beginner gardeners should not feel that all this is beyond them. Horticulture, on quite a large scale, will come your way if you start easily and make haste on the whole rather slowly. Now, you can get into horticulture in a whole manner of ways. Somebody can send you 
a plant that actually is a long-lasting one, like this cast iron palm, as opposed to the sort of little flowering plant one so often given, which once it's over, it's over. There's nothing more you can do with it indoors. But if you've been sent a palm that actually throws up a new leaf in your care, you find novice gardeners so proud and pleased with themselves that they almost draw a picture of it out of their wallet to show you on the tray. You can grow up with horticulture, which means that you take it much more for granted, which is an easier way of getting into it. Or rather late in the party, you can agree to look after a friend's plants on vacation. Any of these ways, just so long as the initial experience is successful and not too much trouble, people very often think that it's all as easy as falling off a log, that they're going now to grow plants. And they take themselves off to the nearest retail greenhouse or florist shop, and that's when the trouble begins. Places of that sort are not set up for gardeners who don't really know what they're up to. They stock large, expensive plants, or they stock splashy, short-lived plants. And usually, the assistants are not willing or anxious to steer you towards easy things. They instead suggest you buy something like this, which is all right for the moment, but goes right over, and you're left again with nothing more. And they're also exceedingly expensive, something like that. Uh, Sheffler Rose would cost anything up to thirty, forty dollars. That is going to be a appalling trauma if that dies on you while you're learning to handle it. This business of not being self-confident enough to ask the right questions is really something that the shops who sell plants should be more responsible about. It's very difficult to get anything done nowadays. Very difficult to get your television set mended, get your dryer mended, get a leak mended. Trained help of that sort is rare, and assistants at, at uh, flower shops very often don't know the answers to the questions you want to ask, even if you know enough to ask them. And because of that, some manufacturers have taken to labeling their plants in an attempt to deal with this particular problem. And though you can't always read the labels, in this case, it's fairly fundamental. It says this is an indoor plant. Oh. Grow in a well-lighted location to prevent from direct sun. Well, basically, the information is right, but it's not going to prevent you from growing it or from buying it. And it's totally unsuitable because it's a gardenia which is going to drop all its buds the moment you get it home. I think really difficult plants should be marked with a skull and crossbone, as poisons used to be marked in my youth. Well, this one's going to have a peculiar problem when we get it home. Uh, it seems to have a little wildlife associated with it. That's probably going to turn into something rather nice. Let's, let's Oh, I would put it on the florist's plant if I knew, but let's take it off my gardenia. The really sensible thing to do if you're looking for plants and you're brand new, you don't know a thing about it, is to go and get small ones, it's not going to kill you if they die, and learn on them. And the place to go then is somewhere like a big garden centre that raises very small plants. The only problem about a garden centre is that they're still in perfect living conditions. They're still, you know, as it were, in a greenhouse. They've not made the hard transition to the realities of life. And you might be even more successful if you went to a supermarket or dime store, which these garden centres do uh, supply, and got plants there. Because any plant that's lived through a supermarket or a dime store for a bit is a hardy soul. The men have been weeded out from the boys, and your house is going to seem like paradise regained in comparison. But they're very picky. Wherever you buy them, be very picky. And buy more than one. Uh, if you don't know how to handle them, do one one way and one the other, and you'll learn. 
reject something like this because it clearly has got a lot of leaves dying off it. And don't get something like this, which is suffering from appalling overcrowding inside the pot. Now there's another one you should avoid because the leaves are yellowed, which is a sign of malnutrition. It seems the most silly thing to advise, but there's nothing lost by smelling your plant. If you don't like the smell, it's in trouble. Yep, root rot. All these are things that you learn by hard experience. And another rather gloomy piece of advice that I want to suggest is at first that you steer away from blossoming plants. They've reached a climax when they come to bloom. And if you're a beginner and you're looking after them, there's nothing left for them but to go downhill. You really should try and get an evergreen that's quietly ticking over, not a plant in full flower. But I'm going to make an exception for that in the form about the uh, Thanksgiving cactus, which is not quite the same as that one there because it's got a slightly different, they're all the same family, but it has a slightly different leaf. That's the kind you see with two rather hideous shrimp-like projections with a bloom on them in early fall. And if you pop two or three of them together, as I have here, and I only put these together last spring, you can see them there, they make quite a good show very quickly. Well, after all this don't, 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 where are the do's in this program? Let me show you the kind of thing that you can get, and which probably will teach you a great deal as you learn to handle it. You go around picking things up right and left right without knowing much about them. And if you're like me, you lose the labels if they're not on them, and you forget the names. You'll notice that as I go through. But it doesn't prevent you from learning. Now, the ones that will help and do well are something like the saxifrage, which is very also rather like my father's moustache. Look at all this. That's a sign of health. That's not a problem. But it does need a lot of cleaning out. This is one of the basics of horticulture that you have to learn, that you've got to get this kind of thing out, or the plant is going to go into decline. Plants in a decline are peculiarly depressing. You may well pick up what's known as the piggyback plant, because it has a very small extra plant growing on its leaf. That also is perfectly cast down and does very well for you. There are always philodendrons available, which should really be pinned in to make them look better. You pin it in round so, with a hairpin, to make it a bushier little plant and a more attractive appearance. If you don't use a hairpin, though the number of the population who don't need hairpins is diminishing rapidly, you can always use a wire, a paper clip. Just turn it into a kind of hairpin, something like this. I had an aunt who, whenever she was doing something like this, used to say something like this, not the least I hope. See, there we go. You pin it in and its feet will take root and its fingers will shoot. And in no time at all, it will look like, some, <laughs> look like this, which is a X pinned in philodendron of mine, which there is by now absolutely no space to pin it in any further. And when you've got yours to that rather beautiful and elaborate condition, you'll knock it out. I hope I'm not going to find on television that I haven't cocked my own plant. Oh, well, put it in where you see it has much more room. Fill it up with soil. I wonder, if you're a complete newcomer, whether you're doing it like me and getting your hands absolutely filthy, or whether you're doing it with gloves. I'll wager that if you get deep into horticulture, you'll soon stop wearing gloves. 
and then you start the pinning process all over again. And these very simple, good-natured plants will grow under a lamplight or anything, too weird, anything you want. They're the easiest things in the world to start with, and you shouldn't despise them because they're simple. There's another very close relative of them, which you will probably find, something called the Saigonium, which is everywhere. See? Oh, I saw a plant that needed a little pinning in. It's that. It's all... I don't think I'm going to get very far pinning it in here. But this is also an excellent tolerant plant. It's going to, is it going to look better? Oh, thank you. Than it did. So, when it was falling down. At least it's not going to fall over all the time, and gradually its leaves will come up at you. You... As you go round, you'll find plants that will teach you various basic facts of horticultural life. Now, if you get a Sansevieria or a Crassula, you'll soon learn not to overwater them, because these are plants that finger and pine if they get too wet. That's why I say buy two, because if you've been watering away and find it dying on you, then you ought to have had a control to running another that doesn't. You also may buy a scissors. Now that's going to teach you to prune if nothing else will, because it gets out of control in absolutely no time. And even the feeblest horticulturalist is going to cut that back, because it's going to be the most ghastly nuisance if you don't. And at the same time, you may get a hoya, which you won't prune. But you better learn not to prune anyway, because a hoya will only bloom when it has an enormous rat's tail, and you've got to learn to let that rat's tail grow. You see, here it is, and the natural tendency would be to cut these things off. But if you do, you cut off the only blooms that are going to form. Somewhere here is the first bud I ever Head. Oh yeah! don't tell me I knocked it off bringing it up. This goes on every time I try and find this bud because I have such a feeling for it. Well, here are new, minute ones forming along the rat's tail. And when, and if, oh, there's my original bud. See? And after it's bloomed, you have to leave that there because all future flowers are going to come from it. And your hoya will also show you very rapidly if you've got it in the wrong position. It looks nice and rosy-cheeked, like this, if it's in shade. But if you put it in the sun, I've ruined a lot of plants on your behalf, it is going to look like this. Perfectly awful. And you must change the position. It's only by constant experimenting that you're really going to be able to handle plants. And an example of this, I mean, it's just not any point in looking at that higher and saying, what happens if I can't grow higher? Just take it away from where you're growing it and try it somewhere else. The plants you probably will find die on you when you buy them, and the ones I wouldn't wildly recommend, but it's up to you to find out, not for me to tell you, are uh, my old friend, the variegated bothos, the skindactus, because that's rather picky. It tasks them to grow, very slow growing, and liable to do this, rot a large hole in you when you're not looking at it. Uh, also, you're probably going to think that the Swedish ivy is a rather delightful plant. Uh, and this is not a rather delightful example of it, but it looks quite nice when you first buy it. The trouble is it very rapidly looks like this. And uh, when you discover that, you will cease buying it. Live and learn. There's also 
great snares in buying anything that belongs to the Ivy family. One of these is a fat sir, and the other is a fat shedder. Uh, they both, this is the parent, as it were, of this, which is a hybrid between Ivy and this original fat sir. And they're very, very troublesome indoors indeed. When I was very small, uh, we still had at home an old-fashioned book called Reading Without Tears. Uh, it was a bit of a misnomer where I was concerned. Uh, my mother, I un ill advisedly, I think, decided to teach me to read out of it. Had curious old-fashioned woodcuts. And I very well remember a frightful scene in which I was made to sing to the tune of Three Blind Mice. The phonetic sound G says G. Uh, people always forget the things children remain vividly aware of because I sang that song with loud wailing hiccups. But you can learn horticulture without tears by going through these plants, watching what does well and learning as you go. Now here are some Tradiscantias. These are very simple plants to grow, and the first would probably look like this. And it would go on and on and on, and it ought to bush. So this again would be a way in which you would learn a horticultural fact of life, because it would occur to you soon to pinch it out. And you might also find that that little thing grew very well. Uh, I don't know what it is. I've lost the label. When you get them, mainly they need repotting. And the thing to do is to buy a few small pots when they come. This one's all right. But if you get something in one of these awful little white pots, I would suggest that you knock them out and pot them up again. And that's another extremely good way to learn about plants. You can see that this has got the reason for its brown leaves is because it's not had enough space for its roots. You can see that it's in rather rich soil. The, those who grow plants for us almost always put them in the appropriate soil. And that is one of the reasons why you needn't be too madly anxious to change the soil, but you ought to give them larger pots. And I myself don't seem quite to have gauged this correctly, but at any rate, where, where am I cutting this up? If I were cutting this up again, just put a little thing in, a pinch of soil, put it down in there again, and you've got a much happier plant. And watch the soils as they come out. Because you can tell a lot of the kind of plant it is, whether the soil is sandy or whether it's very uh, hard, or whether it's heavy and obviously marshy. Now, you may be one of the people, kind of person who likes uh, these little cactus. They are not my favorite plants, and I do think they come in the most hideous little pot. But people grow them, otherwise they wouldn't be on sale. And if you feel you can't stand that pot and want to repot it, you will rapidly learn that the only way to do it is to hold it with a piece of paper while you get it out. And there you see how very sandy the soil, the cactus, has been growing in. These are the basics of horticulture and the way that one learns. And it's an exceedingly good way to have only a few things to have to worry about. If you start with an enormous number of plants, you're going to get uh, overwhelmed. I'd much prefer to see a beginner start even with my non-favorites which are under their eye and which they can watch all the time, than to have them start with big plants 
or so many that they can't take good care of them. And if you compare the speed at which certain plants come, here now is one of these little tiny palms, and here is the one that we looked at a little earlier. This is two years old and has been potted on by me from this. It also was on a very early show. And that makes it really a quite a respectable show. If you had three of those and put them together on a tray, or if you massed anything on a tray in the usual way, we take some of our simplest plants and put them out for you. Let's not find something I told you not to grow. There we are. You already have something that you can look after very well. And if you add to it extremely good natured plants that need very swampy conditions, as well as the plants that you know hate swampy conditions, which you've learnt by this time can't stand them, then you just raise them up. So you take it out of trouble. I agree that's not horticulture on a big scale, but it's manageable, which is the point that I want to make. And it's quite extraordinary how fast it does become on the, and it does become something on a big spare scale. Think back on the jasmine and the tiny little shoot, or even on my old Christmas cactus. And once you've really got going with plants, then you'll be able to go into a florist and know what you want and ask the right questions about it. And don't hesitate to take it back if it dies. This is something that is not stressed enough. Most of us act as though plants were something that if we lose them, it's no good to us. If we're ever going to get something really good out of our purchases, we've got to go back and complain when we find the plant dies on us. Now, you and I can't leap into something huge at once. If somebody nowadays told me to look after all the plants that I care for, and I was beginning, I would say, you're crazy. It couldn't possibly be done. But if I'd started with something very small, I could do it. And if you're taking children to camp, the PTA, to have their teeth straightened and so on and so forth, you know that you can handle things as they slowly accumulate. And that's what we want you to learn to do. And let yourself build up slowly into a good horticulturalist through this program, which is called...